Okay, I want to thank everybody for coming to this special colloquium at a special time. Our, uh, our speaker today is Jorge Moreno. Uh, Jorge got their PhD from the University of Pennsylvania and uh, went on to a postdoctoral position at CISA in Trieste, uh, and then a uh, CETA National Fellowship, um, which they took at uh, the University of Victoria. So this is the Canadian Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics. It's a, uh, it's a big deal. In 2014, uh, Jorge took a faculty position at Cal Poly Pomona, and in 2017, they moved to Pomona College, where Jorge has just been promoted to associate professor with tenure. Jorge is a computational astrophysicist um, who works on uh, many different problems related to galaxy evolution, particularly related to mergers between galaxies and the interactions of galaxies with their environments. Uh, they're a member of the FIRE Collaboration, which is one of the large simulation programs uh, based at Caltech. I think it means feedback in realistic environments. Um, and as part of that col col collaboration, they've been focusing on uh, particularly on low mass and field galaxies, which is actually a very challenging area of galaxy evolution. Um, this work has been recognized with many invitations uh, to uh, meetings and visits. And uh, in most recently, I was very impressed to see that uh, Jorge was last year's uh, Vera Rubin Distinguished Visiting Professor at UC Santa Cruz. So today, Jorge is going to tell us about galaxies in extreme environments. Take it away. Thank you for having me. <laughs> galaxies in extreme environments. So when I say the words extreme environments, what comes to mind is these galaxies are really close to a very massive galaxy that's messing with them. Is this really isolated galaxies? So I'm going to talk about both in this talk. I'm someone who, when I think about galaxies, I, I like to think of galaxies as people. If you listen to me, if you listen to my accent or my mannerisms or the music I listen to, the food I eat, you can infer something about my family, my culture, my ancestry. So the same is true with, with galaxies. And uh, some galaxies are really close to massive galaxies. Other galaxies are in extreme isolation. And when I think about being creative, I also think about my environment. I can be really creative if I'm sitting next to someone who maybe has 40 years of experience doing research and 500 publications, and you can learn a lot from them. Or I'm also really creative when I'm by myself with a glass of wine I don't know, in the mountains, right? So I, as I talk about galaxies, I want you to try to make that connection. But before talking about science, I want to acknowledge that we are on indigenous land on Utearra, Tajo, and Chigin land. I have indigenous ancestry, uh, Kikapu from my father's side and Huichol from my mother's side. So it's extremely important for me to acknowledge the land, but also to remind you that it's uh, important to honor the land. When you come to a space like this, it's really important to think about the energy you bring to the space. If you come angry or with envy or just cranky, that's something you can leave at the door because your behavior is gonna impact others. In many cultures, like the Comanche and the Chigeni, uh, they uh, think about this notion of seven generations. So whatever you do, that's going to affect seven generations. So you need to, so whatever actions we decide to take, we need to do it responsibly. Okay? Just to keep that in mind. All right, so let me give you a bit of an outline. First, I want to emphasize that this talk is for students, especially students who don't do work in galaxy evolution. There, are, there is no such thing as a dumb question. So, and if you ask a question, you are actually enriching this space because there might be some of your peers might have the same question, but maybe they're a bit shy, so you're actually helping them grow. <clears throat> so first I'll talk about galaxies lacking dark matter because extreme environments produce extreme galaxies. Then I'll talk about a few PhD student projects. I have a lot of them. Hopefully I can recruit some of you to work with me. And then I'll talk about CAFECITO. CAFECITO stands for Cosmological Field Simulations. These are going to be next generation simulations that are going to be super awesome. And then, and they're going to be connected to the upcoming US ELT program, the ex Extremely Large Telescope program. And down the road, my 30-year plan is to actually lead a survey using this instrument. As a theorist, I'm not afraid of that challenge. So galaxies lack in dark matter. So if you want to read more, you can uh, read this paper. I'm really proud of this paper. It's mostly theorists, but the second author is an observer. If you're a theorist, I strongly, strongly advise you to work with observers. 
They have the best ideas. They're the best. So I'm really proud of this paper. It has gotten a lot of attention. I grew up reading Scientific American, and so it was really nice to see the cover there. I, I'm from Mexico, so I read Muy Interesante, and I'm really proud that it was uh, featured there. There was also a lot of bad coverage, and I also got a lot of angry emails from cranky people, but that's fine. It comes with the territory, but I'm really proud of this work. So what's going on? So I'm showing you NGC 1052. This is a galaxy group around 20 megaparsecs away. There's a massive elliptical. That's a 10 to 11 solar mass elliptical, but I'm focusing on a satellite. This is NGC 1052 DF2. It's called DF2 because they use the Dragonfly instrument. So this is a very special galaxy. It's really tiny, well, it's kind of fluffy, and we're gonna see that it has some weird properties. So this is another picture of that. Whenever you see a galaxy, you can measure its uh, stellar mass by looking at the stellar light, and they found that uh, this is a 10 to the 8 solar mass galaxy. Now, you can also, uh, you can notice that it has uh, these dots, globular clusters, if these things are moving very quickly, it tells you that the potential well is really deep, so it has a lot of matter. But if they're moving slowly, it's telling you that the potential well is shallow and maybe doesn't have a lot of matter. So in galaxy evolution, we know that when you go into the low mass regime, galaxies tend to be more and more dark matter dominated. In particular, you, in, in specifically, you can estimate what the velocity dispersion of these galaxies should be. So if you don't know what velocity dispersion is, basically what you do is you measure the velocities of your stars or globular clusters, you do a histogram, you feed a Gaussian, and the width is connected to the dynamical, the total mass of the system. So one would expect that for a 10 to the 8 solar mass galaxy, you should have a velocity dispersion of 32 kilometers per second, but what the data is saying is that this is only eight. You were expecting it to be moving quickly, and they're actually moving slowly. And you can do some math. So if you know the line of side velocity dispersion and the size of the galaxy, this R half, is the radius containing half of the mass. That's actually connected to the dynamical mass or the total mass of the galaxy. So you can solve for dynamical mass, and they found that the dynamical mass is consistent with the stellar mass, meaning that there is no room for dark matter. This is uh, NGC 1052 DF2. This is another satellite of the same group, and it has the same property. And this is really weird. I'm just gonna call them DF2 and DF4. They live in this, mass, in this uh, galaxy group, and this is really intriguing. So many people were freaked out. Some people said, well, maybe we need to revise this cold dark matter paradigm. Maybe we need to get rid of that paradigm altogether, or maybe we just need to modify it. Maybe dark matter is not really cold. Other people were like, well, maybe the measurements are wrong. Maybe people are taking data wrong. Maybe the distance is wrong. Maybe the velocities are wrong. So there was a lot of controversy. People who do cosmological simulations like myself jumped into this problem and they tried to solve it. Every team around the world, they used their simulation and everybody failed to reproduce galaxies that look like this, until I came along. Yay, me. <laughs> so can we explain this with simulations? Yes, but you need really good simulations. So this is Firebox. Firebox is a cosmological simulation using the FIRE model. FIRE stands for feedback in realistic environments. And you probably heard of other simulations like Eagle and Illustrious, Illustrious DNG. This is a different class of simulations because those simulations are a bit more simplistic. This, this is the first time we have a simulation where you can actually resolve the turbulent multi-phase structure of the interstellar medium. You can go down to 10 Kelvin, you can go to extremely uh, high densities, and star formation is regulated by feedback from stellar winds, from, from processes in star formation. So I'm a big fan of Illustrious TNG, but those simulations are of the past generation. This is a more modern version of, uh, of simulations. So what did we find? So here I'm showing you the mass in dark matter in galaxies versus the mass in stellar in stars. And I'm not showing you the entire content. I'm only focusing on what I call R half, which is the radius containing half of the stellar mass. And the reason I'm doing that is that's, that's because that's it, what they do in observations. And if you want to compare with observations, you have to try to mimic them as much as you can. You can imagine a bridge between theory land and observation land. You want to cross that bridge. Here I'm only showing you central of galaxies. I can show some lines to guide the eye. And you can divide this plane into the dark matter deficient and the dark matter dominated regime. These are the observations. And when I include satellites, we find that seven of them are actually below the line. 
I gave them really nice names. Wolf, wild potato paint, long hair, bird, blue, and deer. So I, when I found the seven galaxies, I was asking myself, what should we name them? And so my colleagues, I live in Southern California, and my colleagues were like, oh, Disney characters. Now I'm someone who believes that we shouldn't denigrate people with dwarfism, and I've been pushing the field for us to move away from using the term dwarf galaxy, and we can call them low mass galaxies because I think it, that's also actually more scientifically accurate. So it's not gonna be the Disney characters. I thought about the seven sisters in Greek mythology, but I'm not a woman, and I didn't feel it was my place to take that name. I'm a person of indigenous ancestry. I'm not Cherokee. I have a good friend who is, so I consulted with him. He went to people, uh, his elders, and basically he asked for permission on my behalf. Can I use these names of the seven clans in the Cherokee tribe to describe the galaxies? And they say yes. And each galaxy, each of these galaxies has its own, I guess, properties, just like each clan has its own history, cuisine, culture. These are uh, matrices. So I'm gonna show you just a couple of them. This is Wolf. This is a mock Hubble Space Telescope uh, map. So you're looking at stellar light from a simulated galaxy. But in the simulations, we also have dark matter. So you can look at the dark matter and you see that there is no dark matter subhalo associated with this galaxy. These are, oh, these are deer, blue, and bird. And again, you see them here. Deer is fluffy, blue and bird, they're interacting with each other. And you see no dark matter subhalos associated with them. Some of you might have heard of this missing satellite problem. This is the opposite of that. This is the missing subhalo problem. Okay. So how are these galaxies, uh, these dark matter efficient galaxies created? So I think this picture really gives you clues. Probably has to do with interactions. So we find that to become a dark matter efficient galaxy, you have to meet two conditions. The first one is that you have to be interacting with a massive galaxy. And that galaxy is gonna be about a thousand times more massive in stars. We also make a prediction, and whenever you run simulations, it's really important to make predictions so observers can confirm your predictions. I've done this a lot in my career. It's really gratifying. So I, if you're a student doing theory, I encourage you to do so. The prediction we make is that we predict that 30% of central galaxies with at least 10 to the 11 solar masses should harbor at least one dark matter deficient galaxy. We only found two in the universe, but I think there are more. The other thing, th the other condition that you need is that these have to be in extremely radial orbits. So if you look at your massive galaxy and you look at the what we call the virial radius, which is the radius of the host halo, these galaxies have to come within 5% of that radius. So they're not just orbiting around, they actually have to crash through the baryonic component of the galaxy to become dark matter deficient. Some of these galaxies, they come in, they crash within three kiloparsecs, they leave the halo, and then they come back. So they're in extremely weird radial orbits. And I can quantify that in this plot. On the y-axis, we have the minimum distance between a satellite and a central, because in the simulation, you can track that, right? You can track the orbit, then you find the minimum distance, and you rescale it in units of the radius of the host halo. On the x-axis, I have the stellar mass ratio of the satellite versus the central. I can put this uh, observations here, and this is the dark matter deficient galaxy. The number next to the galaxies is the number of pericentric passages. So usually uh, satellites, they do one or a couple of orbits and then either they merge or they dissolve. These galaxies, they do a ton of them, like BIRD does 14 of them. They just, this is like David and Goliath, they just keep coming back and they just keep fighting and they never give up. So they live in this really unique uh, region of parameter space. If the stellar mass ratio is too high, like let's say one to 10,000, the satellite will dissolve. The, the gravitational field of the host halo is gonna be so strong that the galaxy is gonna dissolve, just like a comet. And if you're on this side, if the galaxies are somewhat similar, dynamical friction is gonna be very effective and the galaxies are gonna merge quickly. But there is a sweet spot here where the galaxies survive. And these galaxies, I'm, I feel strongly connected to them for several reasons. One of them is I'm a person who only speaks European languages. I'm a person who has a European name, and I'm a person who was assigned a European gender at birth. But I'm still here. And sometimes where you're, uh, you hold multiple minoritized identities, you're given two choices. Either you assimilate, or you're completely excluded. These galaxies teach us that no, actually it's important to come back and actually fight and, and fix the system, 
but you might end up paying a price like losing your dark matter. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about other kinds of environments. I've been obsessed with galaxy mergers for the better part of the last decade. And I'm really proud that I got this NSF grant to run these simulations. And occasionally I'll be talking about what people in the faculty do. If I don't include you, please forgive me. You can shout, hey, I also like mergers, and I won't be mad at you, right? So but I'll try to do justice to what people do. So with this, with this NSF grant, I run a suite of idealized simulations. So what I do is I created two galaxies, and I put them in a collision course, and I saw what happened. And then I changed things about, like, things about the orientation, or maybe the impact parameter, or the eccentricity of the, of the orbit. So this is a numerical experiment. And I have a lot of control on that. That's different from Firebox, which is a cosmological simulation where you can track the mergers, but you don't have control over them. I love dogs and cats, so I like to make the analogy with that. Imagine you're obsessed with dogs and cats, and you want to know if they get along. One approach is you build a lab, a house, and you put different kinds of dogs and cats together and see what happens, right? Another way to do this is you go to Denver, you knock on every door, and you ask if you have a dog or a cat. So that, the latter would be a cosmological simulation. The former would be these idealized simulations. You can also look at the interstellar medium. With this simulation, you can actually resolve the multi-phase structure of the ISM. And with these simulations, I, I was able to make a lot of predictions about the formation of molecular gas, which may or may not be the fuel for star formation. I actually showed this when I came in 2017. And in 2019, the manga a survey, they actually confirmed that I was right. So when the universe says you're right, it's really, really cool, <laughs> right? So things that I've done with students and postdocs, this is Conor Botrell. He is a postdoc who worked with me. And he was really interested in the machine learning. So she used uh, CNN algorithms to see if, by looking at the image of a galaxy, if you can tell if it had an interaction. So this is, <coughs> you start with the stellar map, so you have the the distribution of stars. So that that's one way to do things. But you can also make mock images. And act in, rather than showing the mass, you can show the light. So you can do that. But also, you can increase the complexity. For example, going from this row to the, this column to this column, he's degrading the data so it's as crappy as SDSS. You want to compare with SDSS, you have to crappify the data. TM, I coined that term. <laughs> And also something he tried is was like, well, we have this, but also we can put it in a real background. We can get an, a blank sky from SDSS and put the, my data on top of that and see what happens. He found that the most important thing that you have to do to teach the machine to identify mergers is pulling the sky, the back sky. That's the main reason. The second reason was actually being able to get blue light. If you have an interaction that produces a starburst, that's a really good way to tell if something had a mer uh, an interaction or a merger. So this is Rebecca McElroy. She uh, is a postdoc in Sydney. We got a grant from Australia. She's an observer, but she really wanted to do a theory project. So I guided her. She approached me, and I guided her through that. Now, I come from cosmology and large-scale structure, where we think of galaxies as dots that just trace the large-scale structure. But it turns out that galaxies are fascinating. They're not dots. You can look at them as little paintings. And you can take it a step further and treat them like little movies or GIFs or TikToks. If you look at the image and you look at the motions, you can get a lot of information. So she, here she's showing the gas and stars on top and bottom. This is just the mass distribution, the line of side velocities, and the velocity dispersions. And it turns out that once you look at the kinematics, you can get more information that can help you uh, decide whether or not a galaxy had an interaction. And this is what she found. So if you look at what she calls photometric for asymmetry, so asymmetries in the image, and kinematic asymmetry, which is uh, asymmetries in the movie, you can actually isolate different types, different stages of merging. So the gray, the gray indicates galaxies that haven't had a merger or interaction. The red indicates galaxies that are just going through their first pass. They're just dating. They're just dancing together. Then. Uh, Blue is there are, you have a really big mess, so they are actually merging right now. And then uh, post mergers would be, well, they already merge and they're just doing their own thing. So it turns out that when you combine kinematics and information about the image, you can more or less tell if a galaxy had an interaction. 
Just like me, if you, if you talk to me and I sound cranky, you probably can tell that I had a bad interaction a few minutes ago. So a little bit like that. Uh, how Hayes and other graduate students who approach me. We don't have grad students at Pomona College, but fortunately, I've been fortunate that people approach me and they want to work with me. So how what he did, he looked at the, he was looking at the properties of the gas. So this is a map of the uh, surface mass. This is the molecular gas. Molecular gas is the fuel for star formation. And here he's showing something that he calls the virial parameter. So basically, if this number is really low, means that the giant molecular clouds are really are gravitationally bound, strongly gravitationally bound. And the expectation is, if a mo giant molecular cloud is strongly gravitationally bound, it should be very efficient at making new stars. If that parameter is low, you should have a lot of star formation. Here, he's showing the line of sight velocity dispersion of the gas versus uh, molecular mass. And he finds that in the simulations, actually, the numerator in that parameter actually goes up. So you are in this really messy environment, you have a lot of feedback, and that actually boosts the motions of gas. He also found the following. So this is a star formation rate versus molecular gas mass. And he found <coughs> that uh, the expectation was that if you are very efficient at making stars, the time it takes you to make stars, which we call the depletion time, is low. So it's the time it takes you to consume gas, right? So he was expecting when it mergers, you should have uh, lower depletion times, which, which we kind of do. But he was also expecting that this viral parameter should be low. So the expectation is, well, if you want to make stars, you need something that's strongly virialized. But it looks like he didn't find that. Yes, we're, going, we're seeing enhancement in star formation, but those molecular clouds are not unusually gravitationally bound. They're actually a little bit loose. That's really intriguing, and that's a project for a graduate student to figure out, hopefully here. But I think the answer is, uh, what's happening here is, yes, these things use made stars, but then the stars are dumping energy and momentum into the ISM, and they're messing up the, mole the molecular cloud. So the cloud was really strongly bound when it made stars, but the stars were born, they started dumping energy and momentum around and messed up the molecular cloud, and now the molecular cloud is no longer strongly bound, it's kind of fluffy. That's my guess. Now, I've been talking about these uh, isolated mergers, that is this experiment where you just take two galaxies and do whatever you want. With Firebox, I'm planning to do look at uh, mergers that are actually in a cosmological box. I'm not gonna stay in my house here, I'm gonna go to Denver and knock on doors. And uh, the reason this is powerful is because in the experiments I ran before, the, uh, you're missing the context. You're missing the cosmological context. You could have a merger, but you could have like other galaxies coming in and interrupting the, the <coughs> what's going on. Just like when I'm having a conversation with my wife and my dog comes and interrupts the thing, this could happen here. You can also have like uh, streams of gas falling in lean. So this is a, I, I want to study mergers in this cosmological box. And I have a lot of ideas for projects, so if you're a student. For example, I want to look at the interplay between the interstellar gas and the <coughs> circumgalactic medium. Because I can rake, in circum, the circumgalactic medium, the, the whole gas around a galaxy can stabilize the disk. I also want to introduce AGN feedback in the simulations. Uh, because I can really mess up things. And something else I want to do is because Let's say you only find 10 houses in Denver with a dog and a cat. Maybe you cannot do it, this is that. But something you can do is the following. Imagine I find a merger in my box. I can grab all the particles. I can run them back in time to the initial conditions. Then I can perturb the initial conditions a little bit and rerun the entire thing. So you get a slightly different merger. You can do this 100 times, and then you get a family of mergers that are cosmologically, statistically relevant. And also, they are slightly different. And you have all these cosmic effects that you don't have in the numerical experiments. And uh, one thing I'm really interested in is resolving star clusters in, in these simulations, because I think we can learn a lot about feedback and star formation. I'm, uh, I'm the theorist on a JWST slash VLA proposal, where we're going to be looking at the antenna galaxies, which is the closest major merger to us, and actually uh, study the, uh, the star clusters there. So now galaxy environment, beyond mergers. So I've been doing a lot of work on environment because I really care about that. And I'm going to showcase some of the work I've done and also invite some uh, projects for PhD students. 
So galaxy environments, you, you can affect galaxies. For example, you can have a tidal stripping because you're interacting with a massive neighbor. And also you can have ramp pressure stripping where a gas-rich galaxy can become gas-poor because the whole halo in the host is stripping away the gas. So I, I wrote a couple of papers to Jenna Samuel. She's a postdoc at UT Austin. And she found something really cool. So it turns out that to quench a galaxy, so when you are a satellite and you fall into a bigger system, the hot gas from that galaxy is going to strip away your fuel. And it turns out that it's not just when that pressure is the highest, but it has to do with that and also the integrated history of how that pressure is affecting it. So you, she found the following. If you take the maximum ramp pressure and divide it by the integral of the ramp pressure in time, that governs how quickly you quench from the moment you reach that maximum pressure to the moment you stop making stars. The higher that ratio, the faster you're going to quench. With Nora Ship, she just got a faculty job at uh, UW. We, we, rather than focusing on gas, we focus on the stars. I really care about stellar streams because they are the remnants of galaxies. It's, uh, sometimes I like to think about what is and what isn't a galaxy, and this is right at the edge of that. You're a galaxy, but you're so heavily stripped that you become a stream. Those streams can also tell you something about the assembly history of the galaxy and about the properties of the dark matter halo. And what we did in this paper is she was actually, there was a little bit of a discrepancy between the number of streams you would predict in simulations and what you observe in the Milky Way. And she found that it was a detectability effect. Once you actually compare apples to apples, she found consistency between the simulations and the observation. Depending on the kind of observations you're using, you're going to get fewer or more, more streams. If you're using SDSS or if you go to Gaia or if you use a DE survey or LSST, which is coming up, you're going to get different numbers. And if you want to compare with simulations, it's really important to make your output so that can be directly compared with observations. Uh, so PhD projects is a more generically some simulations. But I really want to go beyond the Milky Way scale because the fire simulation, they are obsessed with the Milky Way. I have beef with the Milky Way. You can ask me at dinner. I got money from Flatiron to organize a conference, and it's going to be called my beef with the Milky Way. But I think it's important to go beyond the Milky Way. There has been a lot of work going to the massive end, but I also want to go into the low mass end. You have a tiny galaxy in the field, and it, it had a, an interaction with another one. I want to see how that unfolds. I also want to look at environmental quenching beyond the Milky Way scale. So these are really projects that people haven't really tapped. And I also want to look at streams and stellar halos, especially in tiny galaxies. And with LSST, with Rubin coming up, I think now is the time to look at that. I think this, uh, it, when you start looking at isolated tiny galaxies, those are the ones that have the quietest, the most quiet merger history. So you find a stellar halo. That can really tell you something about the first generation of galaxies. Because that thing was dissolved around this tiny galaxy, but the stars are still there. Now, extreme collisions, I talked a little bit about this with the dark matter efficient galaxies. And uh, hopefully, I can persuade uh, <coughs> Julie to also look at these kinds of collisions and other people here. So, these uh, extreme collisions, I just told you before that they are responsible for creating uh, galaxies lacking dark matter. When I published this paper, I got a phone call from David Spurgle who said, Hey, you just solved the low dark matter dwarf problem with the simulation. So it was, it was a really nice. It's nice to have accolades. <clears throat> so PhD projects with this. Uh, again, generally modifying these things or modifying them by hand. You can just literally take your salary and change its direction by hand in the simulations and see what happens. Or maybe you can say, hey, I'm going to decrease the amount of stars it has or the amount of gas by hand. So that's something you can do. And also, I think we can get a lot of clues from the title features. I want to see, by looking at the title features, if that gives us some clues about the interaction history of the galaxy. And I think with LSST, we can constrain this at least. Uh, we, I'm very interested in resolving star clusters. I think these extreme environments where you can really pressurize the gas are good for making star clusters. And this is going to be computationally really hard because I need extremely high resolution and really uh, high cadence. So the snapshots have to be really close together. There is this uh, method called uh, La Lagrangian hyperrefinement. And we've been using that a lot for 
uh, proving how supermassive black holes accrete matter. So people have used that in that field, and I want to export it in here. So basically what I do is I take my satellite, I put a tracer particle, and I resolve, I put a kernel that resolves the galaxy really well as a function of distance from that point, but the rest of the system doesn't have to be super resolved. So that way I'm able to resolve uh, star cluster formation in the satellite without having to resolve the entire system. So I want, if you're computationally uh, interested in doing something like this, this is a good project. And of course I want to introduce AGM feedback. So in our simulations when you introduce AGM feedback, you, you can quench the galaxy, you can make an elliptical, and crashing into an elliptical galaxy might be different than crashing into a spiral galaxy. So I'm really curious to see what we find. Some of you might say, well, this is a really niche project, but I really, I really believe in the warriors, in the revolutionaries, in the oddballs in galaxy evolution. Whenever you find weird galaxies, I think they teach us a lot about the physics of galaxy formation, and I think this kind of collisions, which are really weird, can really teach you something about galaxy formation that we wouldn't learn otherwise. So, AGN feedback. And uh, I know I, I see a lot of your friends here. I just want to make two caveats. The people in the top row, I want to tell you something. The simulations you're using are really crude and unsophisticated. Our simulations are way, way better. The people in the bottom row, our simulations are really crude and, and unsophisticated, and there is a lot of room to grow. So I'm walking a really fine, fine line where I can make everybody happy or really upset. <laughs> but it's really hard to resolve uh, AGN feedback and accretion in cosmological simulations. But I think uh, the fire simulation were really making strides and making progress with that. So this is a uh, work with uh, Daniela Angles Alcazar, where we are we are resolving the process of AGM feedback in the presence of an ISM that is actually resolved. So you can actually resolve giant molecular clouds and the turbulent structure of the ISM, and then you have AGM feedback, which creates this cavity. It quenches the galaxy and it can qu self quench the black hole. So uh, this is a multi-scale process. When you're looking at AGM feedback, it's not just about resolving with really high spatial resolution, but you also have to do it in temporal resolution. So you see that this movie is not changing much, but this one is. And I can talk hours about this. But this is what we've been finding. So this is work with uh, Jonathan Mercedes Feliz. And he found that, so the standard picture is that AGM feedback quenches galaxies. But we found that in some cases, it actually helps promote star formation. So we call this positive feedback. We also make a prediction that if you have positive feedback, it happens in outflows. So if you have star formation and it happens to be in a wind, it was probably caused by AGM feedback. Something we can do in the simulations is we can take the particles, go back in time, and rerun it without AGM feedback and compare the two. And this is what he finds, that when you actually have AGM winds, the locations of star formation happens at larger radii, and it happens later. So it delays star formation, it, it makes it happen at larger radii, and it actually boosts a little bit star formation. Now we found a little bit of a surprise. So you see that little red bump there. So he followed this up, and he found the following, that when you have AGN feedback, you can actually promote the formation of star clumps. So this, we weren't expecting this but having these winds actually helps the stars collapse into a really massive clump of like five times 10 to 7 solar masses, a really high star formation rates. This thing is about 25 parsec. I want you to think about the implications of this. So this is happening in a really short time scale, but this could happen multiple times in the history of the galaxy. It could be the case that you could actually make a black hole in that star cluster and that can actually sink into the center of the halo and build that supermassive black hole. If you're thinking about things like LISA or uh, gravity waves in general, that could have implications there. With <coughs> Rachel Cochrane, she's really interested in galactic sizes. I um, love galactic sizes too, but it's harder than I thought. So AGM feedback can change the size of your galaxy, but that really depends on what observable you're using. So if, you're, if your simulation doesn't really treat uh, ready to transfer and give you deliverables that are observationally friendly, you might get the wrong answer. So it's really important to cross that bridge again between simulations and observation. With <coughs> Lindsay Byrne, we've been playing with AGN feedback, but it turns out that AGN feedback is not really enough. 
So some of us have been thinking about cosmic rays also playing a role. So for people who just like illustrious, illustrious TNG, what happened there is that they weren't really getting the blue cloud and the red sequence, so they really can't top AGM feedback, but that had a problem. That blew out the CGM. So we think that it's important to just have AGM feedback, but with cosmic rays, we don't have to crank up AGM feedback that much, and you retain your circumgalactic medium. So this paper is being refereed at AppJ, so hopefully it gets accepted too. You can see that once you invoke AGM feedback and cosmic rays, <coughs> you stay, you, you do better at the stellar mass, halo mass relation, and in the M sigma relation, you're on both. But once you're looking at the structure of a galaxy, if you look at stellar mass profiles, uh, AGM feedback alone doesn't do a really good job. Once you invoke cosmic rays, it's a little bit more promising. Is the problem is not solved, but it's a promising outcome. Now, cosmic rays are hard to simulate. I think we're, this is in the infancy of its field, but I think it's a promising avenue. So PSG projects with these simulations. I really care about mergers, so I really want to look at the AGN merger connection with actual realistic simulations that resolve the ISM. I want to disentangle the role of environment versus AGN or cosmic ray quenching. I want to go beyond these uh, illustrious, uh, uh, simulations like Illustrious and Eagle and do it right with AGM feedback, but that's really hard. We haven't been, the collaboration hasn't agreed upon this is how you simulate AGM feedback. Uh, our colleagues are well run like 800 simulations and they're like six promising models. But I think once we decide that we can run an entire box with that. So you will have something like TNG with resolved ISM, and that's really cool. And I also am interested in JWST related science. In particular, I'm interested in the transition between burst star formation, where you have really messy star formation, then galaxies quiet down, and then they quench. For the last 15 years, we've seen a lot on the second transition, but on this transition, that's very new, and you cannot do it with older simulations. You need simulations that resolve the ISM. Now, <coughs> one of the reasons I'm really excited about CU Boulder is because Recent hires have had people who do a lot of JWST science, but I want to warn you that that's, I'm, I'm very excited about JWST, but I also have some beef with some of the work that's been done in a rush. So you can see my NPR interview. I am someone who has beef with a lot of things, but I, I'm actually not very cranky. But anyway, I, I'm excited about JWST, but I'm someone who likes to think two steps ahead. So many theories are, the moment JWST came online, they immediately jumped and tried to explain everything. I'm someone who prefers to take a step back and think harder about things. So I'm actually thinking about the next step, which is, oh, which is a US Extremely Large Telescope program. So this is a program that involves extremely large telescopes on the ground that will follow up galaxies where you can do a lot of spectroscopy and you can do really cool things. And uh, I was recently invited to a conference where they asked me to pitch these to NSF and private donors because I think this has to be funded. So, what, beyond JWC, what do we need these ELTs? So this is from a white paper by Weiss and Voiland Colching. This is the mass function of UV selected galaxies. <coughs> and this tells you how deep you can go with HST deep, JWST deep, with lensing. You can only go so far. I can translate magnitudes to halo masses and this tells you how low you can go. This is the farthest you can go. Excuse me. Which means that, yes, JWC is really exciting, but you're only looking at the tip of the iceberg. You're looking at the most massive galaxies in the early universe, but if you want to look at low mass galaxies in the <coughs> a high redshift, JWC is not going to help you. Our only hope is to look at the remnants of those galaxies. <coughs> Sorry, I'm losing my voice. <coughs> so if you look at, for example, the local group, you can look at stellar populations, and you can estimate the star formation history. But to do that, you have to go very deep. So here is uh, some forecast of what we expect. This is a map of the local universe. The symbol size is scaled with mass, and I'm going to start showing colors. This is what you get with JWST. If you want to get to the level where you can really resolve the star formation history, and you need, let's say, 100 hours to do that, which is a lot, but it's reasonable. This is what you would get with JWST. 
And one problem with JWC is it doesn't really do good in the blue bands, so that's a limitation. But what happens when you move on to ground telescopes? Like let's say a four meter <coughs> UV optical telescope or a nine meter telescope, or if you go into an extremely large telescope like GMT, then you can really see tiny galaxies down to like 10 to the three, 10 to the two solar masses, and you can resolve their star formation histories. Why does that matter? Well, environment can shape your star formation history. Like we know uh, satellites in the local group, we can have information about their orbits and when they became satellites by looking at the star formation histories. We can learn about when they quenched. So I'm interested in looking at the most isolated galaxies because I kind of want to look at the control galaxies. I love mergers and interactions. I want to look at the isolated ones. But galaxies are not really truly lonely because they get affected by light. And I believe that if we look at these tiny, super tiny galaxies in isolation, if reionization happened in a patchy way, so you had a massive galaxy here, one here, and the light came at different times, I believe that's going to leave an imprint on the star formation history of these galaxies, which we can observe with extremely large telescopes. So to achieve that before the ELT era, to prepare for that, um, we're, pre we're running this cafecito, which stands for cosmological field simulations. I'm Mexican, so I love, and I love coffee. Cafecito means little Mexican coffee. And also our, sim uh, our the FAR collaboration, they've been doing simulations around the Milky Way. We call them latte. So this is uh, in line with that coffee theme. And the simulations, uh, Francisco Mercado, my postdoc, is the one who's been beginning to run the first generation of these simulations. But I expect this to be as, as powerful as Firebox or Illustrious TNG or the Millennium Simulation. I think this is going to be really groundbreaking. And I think if you're an observer who cares about galaxies, it's going to be great if you're in the front row when these simulations are being made. These are simulations in the field, the most isolated galaxies, the tiniest galaxies. And my ultimate goal is to actually have the first cosmological simulation with resolved stars. And that's going to help us cross the bridge between the fields of galaxy formation and star formation and stars. So I'm a very uh, stubborn person, so I know I'm going to do it. But I think it, this is a really exciting time. So what you do is you have a cosmological simulation like on fire. You select some voids, and you re-simulate them at extremely high resolution. <clears throat> and you can re-simulate them and just keep the physics. You can change the physics. For example, you can change the feedback. Or maybe you can change the properties of dark matter. You can replace cold with warm or self-interacting dark matter if you want, and see what happens. I think the populations of the tiniest galaxies are going to change if, if the dark matter particle has a temperature. And also, you can, when people think about low mass galaxies, they like to think about the impact of, on reionization. Here, this would be the reverse. We will be able, for the first time, to see how the process of reionization actually leaves an imprint on these galaxies. And it can actually maybe not let them be. <coughs> so, really excited about Cafecito. And then we will have the US ELT program. I'm very interested in actually designing a survey and working with observers and people who build instruments and actually carry this out. But this will take me like 20, 30 years. But I'm really stubborn, so I know it's going to happen. So things we can do, focus on the most isolated tiniest galaxies. Try to re actually resolve individual stars. We can look at properties like stellar and gas kinematics, chemical enrichment, star formation histories. We can also focus on the gas around the galaxy, the CTM, or the stellar halos. The stellar halos can give you clues about the first galaxies. We can look at the effects of baryonic feedback or patchy reionization or the nature of dark matter. In the future, in addition to just running these suites, I want to run a simulation that in large scales mimics the real universe. So there are these constrained simulations where you can actually get the Virgo cluster is here, and the, the local group is going in this direction. You can really mimic that, and then taking those simulations, find the voids, and actually re-simulate them and ultimately resolve individual stars. And my favorite part is the following, exotic objects, the oddballs, the revolutionaries, because they can really teach us about galaxy formation. It could be the case that we can find galaxies devoid of dark matter in the field. Who knows? Maybe we'll find really tiny galaxies. This is uh, <coughs> Union's one. It was found by Julio Navarro and others. This galaxy only has 100 solar masses. 
but it has a hefty dark matter halo. This is a really weird thing. Or maybe you will find galaxies like Nube. This one is devoid of stars. It has gas, but no stars. So we can see, we can, in the simulations, we can actually quantify. We can see if they exist, or we can see if, uh, if they, uh, how many of them. Yes, you can love cats and dogs and put them in a house. You can knock on every door on Denver and find them. But what if you find a cat, a dog, and a parrot? Or what if you find a dog that speaks Dutch? This is the nice thing about these cosmological simulations because you can find surprises. And I want to leave you with the following phrase from Isaac Asimov. The most exciting phrase to hear in science, the one that heralds new discoveries, is not Eureka, but that's funny. What the hell is going on? And I hope if you hire me that I will be able to provide opportunities for students and postdocs so they can have these that's kind of funny, weird moments. Thank you for your generous attentions. Any questions? Hmm. Amy. Amy. If not, I can repeat the question. Mm. Mm. So a mixed question as well. Many people have been using simplistic uh, cosmological simulations and with machine learning you can paint properties like baryonic properties, right? Is that a, a good method to use? I think in principle, yes, if you want to look for average trends. But if you want to look for oddballs, if you want to look for the revolutionaries, you, you will definitely miss them. I like to make the analogy with admissions. I think using something like the GRE or the GPA is a really great way to identify potentially good grad students. But you might be missing really awesome students. But yes, it's OK to rely on, on cheap uh, methods. <laughs> but I think it's really important to also be thorough. So that's my philosophy. You don't need to agree with that, but that's how I see it. Yes, so the question is what, uh, co what uh, computational ad advances do we need to actually achieve this? So I'm being a bit of a coward because I didn't say I'm gonna simulate, uh, run the first cosmological simulation with galaxy clusters and BCGs that resolve stars. I'm focusing on voids because they only have tiny galaxies. So if you have a thousand or 10,000 uh, stellar mass, then that's manageable. I think uh, one, one barrier would be computational power. So I think we need to be really smart and selective when we decide among the suite of simulations which one we want to choose to to try to achieve that. But it's not just computational power, it's also the physics. There are many simulations out there who, they just increase resolution and hope for the best. When you increase resolution, you need to think about the various physical processes that operate at the subgrid level. I'm not a, an expert on the stellar revolution, but it's some, one of the things I like about APS is that there is so much diversity in the kind of science people do that I can just go down the, the hallway and knock on people's doors. So we'll see. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. So the question is, looking at these dark matter efficient galaxies, what is the mechanism that it strips the dark matter without really stripping the stars? The answer is it actually strips both, but it, it strips the dark matter more efficiently. And the reason is because uh, to make stars, you need strongly bound gas. So these stars are actually, are actually born strongly gravitationally bound. So it's really hard to strip them. You lose like, I don't know, 99% of your dark matter. You only lose like 90% of your stars. So why exact, how that process really unfolds, I think it has to do with the fact that when you think about satellites are usually orbiting a uh, massive galaxy, but these gal satellites are actually crashing to the baryonic component of the galaxy. So they are a class of their own. 
So I think barium barium interactions, especially in the gastric phase, it could be uh, it could be really weird. So I put together an SF proposal where we plan to do these zooms and re-simulate those processes, and we'll we'll find out. Yeah, but I think the easy answer is well, the stars are born more gravitationally bound. Yes. It's James, right? So James' question is, uh, this Union's uh, one, this galaxy with 100 solar masses, why isn't that considered a galaxy? And even DFT and DF4, like you could say, these aren't really galaxies. So if you ask people in the field and you ask them, what is a galaxy? They usually say it's something that has a dark matter halo. It has variants, it has gas stars, and a dark matter halo. Uh, this galaxy, the Union's one has a real, well, if you look at the kinematics, it's consistent with having a very massive halo. So that makes it a galaxy. Whereas a star cluster wouldn't have a, a massive halo. And that is important because if you have a massive halo, you can have episodes of, of star formation where you can retain your variance and then you have multiple generations of metallicity. Whereas a star cluster, which is formed at one soup, you only have a type of metallicity. So that's how you distinguish it. What I advocate for, especially in the case of DF2 and DF4, is to revisit the definition of galaxy and rather than saying it has to have a dark matter halo, you have to say it has, ha it has had to have a dark matter halo at some point in its history. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Erica. So you want to see the simulated galaxies? or The, the simulated galaxies maybe here, here are some. Okay, so the question from Erica is, the, the images I'm showing here, the satellites seem to have these prominent tidal features, whereas DF2 and DF4, they seem to not have really tidal features. And this is, I'm gonna go back a few slides here to, oh, it's fine. No, actually, no, it's, we're actually quite close. It's, uh, it's this guy here. So this one, which wasn't in the images I showed you, this is long hair. This is about 400 megaparsec from the center of the galaxy, and it doesn't show tidal features. If you look at the stellar light, the white stuff, it looks pretty stable. You can look at the velocity expression from multiple angles, and it looks exactly the same. It looks like an isolated galaxy. Once you go into really deep imaging, like this is below LSST, then you can start seeing tidal features. About the ones that Peter and others found, there is still a lot of debate about whether or not they have tidal tails. And if you talk to people like Nacho Trujillo, he will say, no, actually, they do have tidal tails. So I, don't, I think the, the, the coin is still in the air. It's not decided whether or not they have uh, tidal features. I think LSST or the service, or just going, getting more hours on, I don't know, Hubble can help. Does that answer your question? And we can talk about the mechanisms too, because I have a lot of beef on with Peter about that. But we can do that at dinner. I'm a really friendly person, I promise you. <laughs> My students love me. <laughs> so the question is, what is uh, the relative importance of supernova feedback versus AGM feedback? In the fire simulation, I think we do a really good job at modeling supernova feedback and also feedback from winds from stellar processes. AGM feedback, where uh, introducing that, I think it really matters for massive galaxies. But in the case of these galaxies, because they crash with a massive galaxy, it matters very little. I think in the field, it won't matter that much. They, people do find AGN in low mass galaxies. My belief is that if you find them, it's probably, you're looking at something that looks very much like a seed black hole. And Mitch can disagree with me. 
but I think uh, if you go AGN in a tiny galaxy, you're going to destroy the galaxy. I, I, I don't see a reason why that wouldn't happen. Yeah, low mass galaxies, they don't behave like, they're not mini Milky Ways. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. So the question is, uh, I've been complaining about illustrious CNG, even though Lars Hernquist writes letters for me. Maybe don't tell him. Uh, he knows. Uh, so what about Firebox? So what's different is the not is is the how feedback couples with the ISM. When you can resolve giant molecular clouds, the coupling is gonna be non-trivial. So I think that's what's different from. If you can only resolve down to one KPC or if you can resolve two parsecs, that's gonna make a difference in how the how effective the feedback is, especially when you're if it's mechanical feedback where you're pushing the, the ISM. If you wanna say, for example, if you if in our simulations we find positive AGN feedback because you are able to resolve the interstellar medium. Mm -hmm. I think that's one difference. The other one is uh, if you talk to people like Elio Quater or Phil Hopkins, it looks like cosmic rays may also matter. And actually, Lars Hernquist himself told me that too. So I don't know what the status is of their simulations using CR, but that's a promising area. Okay, so the uh, Jane, right? So Jane's question is, what is cosmic ray feedback and and I've never heard that before. I'm actually really new to that too. So you should invite Elliot to talk about this, but I can say a little bit about, so basically when you have supernova explosions, you can emit high, high energy uh, particles, and these particles can bounce around like a, like a random path, which can actually help you maintain the gas warm. So it, it prevents cooling. And so you maybe an agent can quench the galaxy, but the cosmic rays will, uh, keep it warm and keep it quenched. And uh, I mean, many people have been thinking about CR for many years, but I think what Elliot and Phil are doing that's new is the implementation in a numerical simulation, which I, they're finding it to be really challenging. Yeah. Does that answer your question, Jane? Okay, so the question is, uh, we make a prediction that 30% of massive galaxies should have a, a dark matter deficient galaxy, right? And it's Christine, Caroline, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, Caroline, I will remember, I promise. So Caroline's question is, well, where do you get this 30%? So you have the cosmological box, you pick up all the massive galaxies, and then you just count uh, which ones have a dark matter deficient galaxy. So now the number we got, it's about a third about a third of massive galaxies have satellites that have these really weird orbits where, the, where the, the satellite can crash into the baryonic component of the central galaxy. And I think that's connected with large scale structure. It might be that the location in the cosmic web governs whether or not your central galaxy can have a satellite with such a radial orbit. I think bigger simulations like TNG can actually help us uh, answer that question. Caroline, did that answer your question? Thank you. James. So the question is, uh, from James is, uh, I claim that uh, when Jonathan found this, that AGM feedback can promote the formation of star clusters, that I was a surprise. And w uh, the question is, why does that happen? So this, this, uh, these winds can actually compress gas and actually promote the formation. Yeah. 
So it's kind of like positive AGM feedback is basically you are, you are compressing gas and you can have cloud-cloud collisions that foment star formation. And eventually you have enough that it becomes a, a self-gravitating system. But the thing is like those are just numerical experiments, but I think in a cosmological simulation you, can, uh, you could quantify how often this happens and that could have uh, an impact on the number of supermassive black holes out there. Does that answer your question, James? Let's thank Jorge once again for a great talk. Thank you.